Welcome to BCS, the Chartered Institute for IT. Uh, today we're speaking to Professor Ross Anderson, who won the 2015 Lovelace Medal, and hence will be doing the 2016 uh, Lovelace Lecture. Uh, and that's for his work in uh, making uh, security engineering into a, a discipline. And we're going to speak to him a little bit more about uh, the various strands of uh, his career now. So thanks very much for joining us. Uh, uh, Professor Anderson, can I ask first of all just how you feel about getting uh, this particular award? Well it was an unexpected surprise uh, and, and of course a great surprise and a great honour. Um, you know there's the, the, a very good friend of mine, Karen Spark Jones, uh, won the award mm. oh, about a dozen years ago. Yes. Um, I, I never expected I'd follow in her footsteps. Okay, well that's great. Now you, you pioneered the study of uh, API security. Can you tell us um, some of the um, what was required to do that? Give, give the, the viewers some insight into what was needed to, to develop that. Okay, well, one of the things that people had studied quite a lot was cryptographic protocols. So these are the exchanges of perhaps three or five messages that happen when you set up a cryptographic key in a system mm. or when you encrypt a PIN and pass it to a bank for verification. Uh, but these are actually implemented in hardware security modules and the hardware security module might have 50 or even 500 commands that it can um, execute using keys that are encrypted or that are kept within tamper resistance hardware. So you might have a command such as um, accept an encrypted PIN from an ATM, decrypt it and then re-encrypt it with a key that you share with Visa mm. or alternatively um, check it against an account number and return yes or no. And it occurred to me around about 2000 that the manuals for these systems had become so big and so complicated that there was bound to be a bug in there somewhere. Right. And I'd seen a previous example um, of, of a flaw in a command set when I'd been working in banking in the mid 80s. And so I got a new research student, Mike Bond, and I said, OK, Mike. And I handed him the manual for the IBM 4758. I said, nothing this big and complex can possibly be secure. Find the bug. OK. So um, he went off into a corner for three weeks and came out and said, I found it. And that turned out to be a false alarm, so he went off with his tail between his legs for another week or so and then came back. And this time he'd struck pay dirt. And with Mike and with another student, Jolly and Clulo, um, we discovered a whole series of vulnerabilities in APIs. And we basically broke every hardware security module in the market. Okay. So what basically happens is that you stare at a manual for long enough and you realize that if you do transaction 196 followed by transaction 34, um, you know, combine the results and pass them through transaction 376, then out pops the bank's master key. Right. Because there was a feature interaction, there was a path to plain text that the designers simply hadn't anticipated. Yes. So we had a fascinating series of interactions with the banking industry where we would go through the responsible disclosure process for a vulnerability, we'd tell the, the vendor, the the Fed, the European Central Bank, whatever, of a vulnerability and it would maybe get fixed and then of course a new one would be introduced yeah. because the marketing people were forever thinking up a new transaction to support a new feature yeah. and they weren't stopping to check whether it would interact with the 500 transactions that they already had. Mm. So that was a, a fascinating um, lesson, firstly in the dangers of complexity uh, and secondly um, in the strength on the one hand and the limitations on the other hand of formal methods because we managed to mm. find some of these things using theorem provers, but we also find, found that formal methods just don't scale to transaction sets of that size. And how did you find the responses you got back from the organizations when you actually um, went through the proper process of revealing the vulnerability? Very set in their ways, willing to listen? Oh, well, I mean, the first major vulnerability that we reported was the IBM 4758, which was the um, it was the top prize because it was the one security module then that had been evaluated to FIPS 140-1 level 4. In other words, the US government had said it was unbreakable, mm. so, so of course we broke it. <laughs> and um, we reported it to IBM and we told them that in 10 months time we were going to disclose this vulnerability at the Auckland conference, IEEE Security and Privacy. So all right, they said. And then about a week before the Auckland conference was due to take place, I happened to run into a senior manager from IBM who was in charge of their banking systems in Europe, Middle East and Africa. And I said, well, how have you been getting on with fixing the 4758 vulnerability then? What vulnerability? 
And it turned out that for 10 months, the um, hardware security people at Watson Labs had been arguing with the software security people at Raleigh, North Carolina over whose fault it was. <laughs> so um, we ran the paper at Auckland uh, and it got a lot of press coverage and all of a sudden a large number um, of downloads of our paper took place from IBM.com mm. and the vulnerability got fixed. Uh, okay. So I'm afraid sometimes it's only when you disclose the vulnerability yes. um, that a large and torpid corporation gets off its backside and fixes it. A little bit of organisational inertia there. That's one way of putting it. Yes. Um, you're clearly very big on communication, so apart from this very technical stuff, you, you've also helped a number of people get their, their cash back from, from, from being uh, uh, um, having it extorted or taken off them by fraud, however you want to put it. But you, you have a recent example, I believe. Well, one recent example is that a, a British sailor went into a bar in Barcelona and he bought a round of drinks for 33 euros and um, the following day in Paris he found that his account was empty because a wicked chip and pin terminal had debited his card for 3,300 euros 10 times, right, once per hour for the 10 hours after he'd made that transaction. Promise. And um, Lloyds Bank took the view um, that this is chip and pin and therefore it's completely secure, therefore it's your fault, therefore we've taken all your money, go away. Hmm. So he was very upset at this and um, he hired a lawyer and the lawyer came to us and we got the transaction logs um, and we figured out what had gone on because the transactions had been filed through different banks, supposedly from the same terminal but with different terminal characteristics. And what had actually happened is that the terminal, when his card was in it, had done not um, one transaction, but at least 11 transactions, possibly more, possibly about 20. Um, and it had then simply replayed them one mm. by one through different banks. And the fact that this is possible is due to a flaw in the EMV protocol, whereby um, when you make a chip and pin transaction, uh, your card computes a message authentication code uh, on the amount, on the currency, on the date and also an unpredictable number to stop transaction replay and the flaw is that that unpredictable number is generated not by the bank which issued the card right but by the terminal okay so if the terminal is compromised um, then the yeah. unpredictable number doesn't give you yes. any protection Oh, interesting. And um, this is only the latest in a long series of EMV vulnerabilities that we've discovered over the past 10 years. And in most cases, what, what's happened is that somebody um, gets ripped off, they get told to go and jump by their bank, so they go and Google for you know, chip and pin security or something like that, mm. and they find our web pages because we've written lots of papers in the past on EMV security, and they send us an email, <laughs> an email saying help. Yes. And so, so this in effect acts as a telescope and gives us advance warning mm. on some new modus operandi that the crooks have come up with. Yeah. And in fact since that Barcelona case we found an, a number of other cases including some here in England in Bournemouth for example uh, where people going into nightclubs have been rolled. You know they've th been thinking that they were paying a hundred pounds on their cars and ended up paying thousands. Yes. And so clearly there's a bad guy somewhere who's selling yeah. toxic chip and pin machines to dodgy businesses. Yes. The chap got his money back, I believe. Yup, our man got his money back yeah. and um, was quite pleased. Pleased to do so, I'm sure he was, yeah. Uh, on the idea of uh, mm. communication, do you think a lot of the problems um, with, with um, IT policy and security policy are perhaps caused by poor communication between experts and, and those that perhaps do the administration, say, say the government or, 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 or the, the, the board of, a, of an organisation? Well, there's some of that, I'm sure, but it's not the real problem. Um, the real problem, I think, um, is that there's an issue of culture, particularly in the public sector. Um, the public sector has long been technophobic and has disliked science as well as technology too. Uh, the saying in Whitehall is that scientists should be always on tap and never on top. And so despite manful efforts by CIOs in um, government departments and centrally in the cabinet office, the problem is that they're just too far down the food chain. Mm. And they're not at the table where the decisions are made and therefore really dumb decisions get made which they then have to implement as dutiful civil servants because the minister has said so. Yes. And therefore the, um, the job of a government CIO doesn't always um, 
attract, you know, the sort of people who, you know, might end up as a, a CEO of a tech company. Mm. Uh, you know, you have to um, accept a, a kind of second class lot in life to be an IT guy in government. And that's one of the things that causes real problems. For example, GCHQ um, has been trying to recruit people from um, security research teams and complaining that it can't hire anybody who's any good. The problem is that if you're about to get a first class honours degree from a Russell Group University in computer science, mm. why should you go and work in Cheltenham for 30k yeah. if you can go and work in the city for double that? Yeah. And, and that's not all, because if your career ambition were to end up as a director of GCHQ, you mustn't study computer science. No. You must study Russian or Chinese or Arabic or something like that. Mm. And or be a career civil servant, perhaps. Well, exactly. Uh, I actually came across this in banking because the first bank that I worked at um, wouldn't promote tech people into general management. Right. And um, once I realised this, I uh, didn't renew my contract there. I then moved to another bank, Standard Chartered, which did do this because they were competing in Hong Kong against HSBC, which also promoted tech people into general management. And mm. as a result, they ended up with very good IT systems. Yes. And so it's just a matter of, in the private sector, of competitive behaviour that you make sure there's at least one guy in the C-suite who actually understands systems. Yes. Uh, government isn't exposed to these competitive pressures. And so you've got government department after government department after government department makes one failed project after another because they don't have anybody with clue sitting around the table where decisions are made. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Now, um, in the release you sent out when you, when you were awarded the medal, uh, you talked about one of your goals being to engineer security at a global scale. Can you tell us some of the uh, problems inherent in that idea, what, what you're facing with that? Well, when I first started doing cryptography and security in the mid-80s, um, systems were basically constrained by the company that you worked in. Now, there were things, the, the early ATM networks, but they were kind of special. Mostly if you had a problem about securing something, about getting permission to change software or impose access controls or whatever, you could resolve disputes by going to lowest common manager. Yeah. But this stopped working in the 1990s as everything had joined up together. And round about 2000, a number of us began to realise that if you're going to have secure systems that have got thousands of companies and millions of people using them, then the security that you get will be the outcome of the competitive and selfish behaviour of all the companies that take part. Mm. And that's called a market equilibrium. Mm. So all of a sudden, if you're going to build systems that are secure, or even systems that are dependable, it's not enough to understand the theory of cryptography. You have to understand game theory as well. Okay. And this was a huge breakthrough, um, you know, we, uh, which completely transformed the way that I, I think about these things. And it came about in a discussion with Hal Varian, who was um, then a professor of economics at UC Berkeley and is now Google's chief economist. And that caused me to rewrite my security engineering book, which was only about um, three or four months away from being delivered to the publishers, <laughs> and to write a paper on it, and an awful lot followed from that. Yes. Now, as global scale has become ever bigger and ever more global and ever more big data, things are starting to change in other ways too, because there's an awful lot of properties that you can scale up to a certain point, but not beyond that. Um, for example, take anonymization. Mm. In the old days, if you had systems that were constrained, say within a hospital or within a general practice, um, you could take people's records, you could anonymize them by taking their names and addresses off, and you could pass these to researchers to use within the organization for research, and there was relatively little risk. Mm. And most patients wouldn't be bothered, particularly if you put up a notice warning them that you did this. No. But once you start doing this on a global scale, things break, right? Because your medical record contains an awful lot of stuff about you that identifies you, yeah. some of which is public, some of which may be very private. Yes. And if records are out there, but without names and addresses, they're really, really easy to re-identify, particularly if they find their way around many organizations. 
So anonymization is one thing that breaks when you move into a world of big data. Um, another thing is backdoors or emergency access mm. to systems, key escrow as it was called in the 1990s. Um, back then there was a move to push for all systems that use cryptography to have a backdoor somewhere so that a policeman could turn up with a warrant and get stuff. And it may make some sense if you're a corporation and you issue laptops to your executives to have a recovery key for bootlocker, for example. Yes. Um, but that, again, doesn't scale. Um, if all of a sudden all the law enforcement agencies in the world want access to this, and what's more, want covert access to it, the engineering becomes impossible and so does the governance. Yes. So an awful lot of things that we might have been able to get away with, with carefully engineered, slow-moving, medium-scale systems, just don't work anymore. No. And is the problem going to be only exacerbated when we get billions of other devices attached to the internet through the Internet of Things? And that's presumably another vector for, for problems. How do you view that? I'm not entirely um, convinced by the rhetoric of the Internet of Things because we've been here before. Mm. Um, back in 2000, they were called Things That Think. Mm. And back in 1990, they were called Embedded Systems. Yeah. And um, when you look carefully at what people are marketing under the aegis of Internet of Things, it's the same stuff, um, you know, but more of it with faster CPUs, better communications yeah. and so on. Now, the individual systems are, are really, really interesting. What's happening in cars, for example, is something that fascinates me. Um, are we going to get to driverless cars through adding one feature after another? Mm. You know, adaptive cruise control, automatic emergency braking, automatic lane keeping and so on, until eventually we get to the point that you can climb into your car and fall asleep. Um, or are we going to get there all in one big leap, as Google is trying to do? Mm. And this has many, many implications for all sorts of other things. But my feeling is that the Internet of Things will turn out um, to be a number of different systems, your, your car system, your home systems, your what you have in your mobile phone and so on, but that will collaborate. And managing that collaboration is going to present all sorts of really, really interesting and difficult problems. Mm. Now, you mentioned, um, or rather we quoted uh, you as, as talking about adapting to existing systems as the environment evolves, as their environment evolves. Can you tell us a little bit about what you mean by, by that? You gave me an example earlier of uh, Facebook, I think. Well, um, in, in the case of Facebook, here you've got a, a lucky guy who wrote a system to help his classmates at Harvard get debts mm. and it's escaped the lab and suddenly he's got a billion users yeah. and suddenly it isn't all you know, nice, well-behaved, homogeneous 19-year-olds who all know each other no. using the system and all the world's problems and conflicts are suddenly being played out on yes. your servers and all the competition between different companies that use Facebook for marketing, that's happening there too. Yeah. And how do, you, how do you keep some kind of control of this? How do you keep the system usable without having it spammed out like MySpace was spammed out? Yeah. Um, how do you um, keep it open and friendly enough for people to use uh, while keeping enough control that it isn't abused? Um, how do you manage the terrible trade-off uh, between people's desire for privacy and your advertisers' desire for their data, which I don't think Facebook manages particularly well? Mm. Um, there are many, many other examples that if you've got a successful system that starts scaling up, then eventually you start meeting all the world's problems and yeah. then suddenly you're in a different kind of business. Yeah. I, I would take it that you don't perhaps subscribe to the utopian view of, of those that think at some point we'll have some sort of singularity where we'll all be able to merge with our machines and upload our minds and be free to the strictures of the flesh and, and so on and so forth. Well, it's, in, it's interesting science fiction Yes. You know, that one day you, you know, might be able to press the upload button as you felt your heart failing. Um, I rather fear it won't be around in time for me. So. 